All right, good evening, everybody. It's six o'clock, so we're going to get started. Just a sound check, can folks hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in to our Introduction to Winter Growing webinar. Um, today, uh, we will have two speakers. My name is Elizabeth Hodgson, and we'll be joined today by Jed Reed. We're both vegetable specialists with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I hope everybody had a nice holiday and happy new year. And personally, I think it's energizing to think about growing um, green vegetables in the winter time, which is totally possible up here in the north. So I'm just gonna take a couple um, seconds to get everyone oriented to using Zoom. So before we start, I'm just going to ask everyone except the speakers to mute and stop your video. That just prevents um, any excess background noise from interrupting the program. And we will have a Q&A session at the end where people can either unmute themselves and ask questions or throughout the program, if you'd like, you can enter them into the chat box, which should be at the bottom of your screen with the chat bu bubble icon. And we'll try to make sure that we get to everybody's questions at the end. And so just a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a vegetable specialist based in Plattsburgh at the Cornell Cooperative Extension office in Clinton County. County. And my interests are season extension and winter vegetable production, as well as pest man management and um, food safety. And Jed, do you wanna just give a brief introduction? Sure. So my name is uh, Judson Reed. I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm based in the Finger Lakes area of New York State. Uh, however, I work throughout the state on a number of different projects. Um, and my area of specialty, I would say, is at this point probably uh, soil nutrition for protected crops. All right. So we are going to start with Judd just giving a little introduction to high tunnel production and winter, winter growing specifically. Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. So we're going to go over some basics here just to make sure we're all on the same page uh, in terms of what we're talking about this evening. Our focus is winter growing, so we're going to devote the majority of our presentation to that subject. But first, just so we know what we're talking about, what is a high tunnel? Well, high tunnel is a greenhouse. Uh, New York State Ag and Markets would call it a temporary greenhouse. <clears throat> And some common features of that is that generally we're talking about a single layer of plastic. We have low to no heat inputs and we have passive ventilation uh, compared to say fans, which would be forced ventilation and louvers. The other and probably most common attribute of a high tunnel, what makes it different from other greenhouses is that it's soil based. And you can see on the right hand uh, part of this slide, a soil based high tunnel in St. Lawrence County, New York, growing a number of different crops. So any one of those parameters may change. Sometimes we have people with high tunnels with a double layer of plastic, or they may have um, emergency heat or in-ground heat. Some people might have fans. But generally what we're talking about are soil-based greenhouses, um, oftentimes with less technology than full-scale greenhouse. Let's see. Looks like I can't advance, um, Elizabeth. Let me just go ahead and do that for you. That's perfectly fine. Um. Okay, so uh, far and away the most common high tunnel crop in New York and elsewhere, as far as we can tell, is tomatoes. Here we have state tomatoes, uh, determinate tomatoes, the shorter variety, and we grow those inside for a number of reasons. Most importantly is that by growing them inside, we keep rain off of that foliage, so we achieve a considerable degree of disease control uh, by excluding uh, free moisture on the leaves. And we also accumulate more growing degree days or heat units in that crop quicker. And so oftentimes when we talk about high tunnels, we're talking about season extension. For these warm season crops, I think the word season acceleration is more appropriate because we're accelerating the growth and maturity of that crop. Next slide, please. These are tomatoes and now we have cucumbers. You read my mind, thank you. No, you can go to the cucumbers, Elizabeth. So uh, tomatoes are 
the most common crop by a long shot. Um, there's close to 500 operations in New York State growing tomatoes alone under plastic. Some other outstanding opportunities do exist, particularly in vegetables like cucumbers, which grow vertically and allow us to take advantage of this vertical space that we've created inside. And so if I were to grow this same crop of cucumbers outside, I would probably need uh, two to three times the amount of square footage to achieve that amount of uh, canopy that I am here in this uh, 20 by about 100 foot high tunnel. Next slide, please. Now here we can see some other warm season crops that do very well inside. On the right in the middle we have um, uh, snacking peppers. So these are sweet peppers, not hot peppers. Um, and on the left, of course, we have some cherry tomatoes. But then this spiky one in the middle, does anyone have an idea what that might be? Next slide, please. This is ginger. Uh, and you can see generally what we harvest with ginger is the root or rhizome, uh, which makes uh, which can be turned into the ginger that we might use in uh, different types of cooking. We can also use the tops to create a tea as well. And high tunnels allow us to grow a crop like ginger in the Northeast that we really wouldn't be able to do so otherwise, again, because of that accumulation of growing degree days. Um, this is a really exciting crop if you have a market that um, is interested in, in um, eating something like ginger. Next slide, please. I'd also like to highlight the opportunity that exists with small fruit in high tunnels. Here we have black raspberries, not blackberries, but black raspberries. These can be grown inside of high tunnels and the shelf life will be uh, remarkably longer when the crop is grown inside versus outside. We also get larger berries inside versus outside and most importantly we get those berries earlier so we can have black raspberries mature within strawberry season which creates some great marketing opportunities and high tunnels really make that happen. But we're here today to talk about winter greens uh, and how we use these high tunnels not just for season acceleration, but for true season extension. By extending our growing season into a time of the year where we normally wouldn't be able to do that. And that's what you see here in this slide is a high tunnel in Washington County, New York in about the third week of January. And if you're not familiar with um, some of the uh, pieces of technology here, I'd like to point some of them out to you. First is, there's really not a lot for you to see in this image aside from what we call row cover, which is a spun bond cottony type of material that would allow air and a certain amount of sunlight to move through it, but also retains some heat for us. Uh, and so growing in the winter time inside of a high tunnel really requires the use of low tunnels or at a <coughs> minimum laying this row cover over top of the crop. And what happens is, thank you, we remove that row cover on a daily basis. And underneath this, this was the same um, high tunnel taken just a, a couple hours later once the sun had come out. We have a beautiful crop of Swiss chard, of kale, of arugula, a number of Asian greens. And Elizabeth's going to talk in greater detail about what exactly can be grown. But before we get into those crops, we have to understand how we grow this. And what we're doing is removing those row covers in the daytime and allowing the sun to come in and not just hopefully help the plants photosynthesize, but it's charging this soil with heat, with heat energy. And then once the sun goes down, that heat energy wants to escape in the form of infrared wavelengths. And by drawing these blankets or row covers over top of the crop in the evening, we trap just enough heat within the canopy to keep these crops alive. Now, when I say just enough heat, it is just enough. Oftentimes we're, we're still getting into freezing temperatures uh, underneath there, but um, <clears throat> not enough to kill the crop. So before I go to my next slide, maybe I'll answer a question here in the chat uh, from Harrison Bardwell. Timing of removing footing on row cover on certain days and temperatures. 
That is a great question. Um, so the timing in general, to make it simple, would be anytime the sun is out. We want to capture as much sun as we can. Another way to think of these high tunnels really is that they are uh, passive solar greenhouses so that we are collecting the heat, again, not just to make the plants photosynthesize or, or sunlight, not just to make the plants so photosynthesize, but that is our form of heat and we're storing it in the soil. So we want to capture as much sunlight as possible. Putting it on, we want to put it on as soon as the sun goes down because at that point, the greenhouse plastic in a sense acts as a vacuum. It, it moves heat effectively out of that greenhouse very quickly. It takes it out of the ground and, and moves it into the atmosphere. So by putting this row cover over top, immediately on top of the canopy, we're trapping those wavelengths from escaping at dark. Now, there are some people that will leave that row cover on on cloudy days if they feel there is the temperature is low enough, let's say the temperature is well below freezing, and there's not enough sunlight for any what we would call thermal gain. So we're not gaining any temperature by leaving it on. Uh, Elizabeth, you want to play that video? So here we can see this happening again in the morning once the sun is out. And this is a crop of what's known as Salanova, which is a, uh, a single cut lettuce that creates a, a wonderful mix of lettuce. And you can see there's multiple layers of row cover there. Uh, just taking two people a few seconds to pull that all together. And here they're not even using hoops. Um, and there are growers that increasingly believe they don't need to use hoops um, to suspend the row cover over top. But that is a daily activity if the sun is shining and they will have to recover that in the evening. Anything else I should cover there, Elizabeth, or are we ready for crops? I think we're ready to talk about some crops. And so I yeah, so I've sort of just divided up potential winter high tunnel crops into three different groups. And by far, I would say uh, the most common are greens. So these include spinach, Asian greens, Swiss chard, as Jed mentioned, and a few others. There are some growers who will grow uh, root crops and allium. So for example, overwintered onions, carrots, and radishes. These can be a little bit more tricky and are lesser grown um, compared to the greens. And then for specialty markets, there are some growers who will overwinter herbs and even flowers in high tunnels. And so I'll be presenting some information on different uh, potential crops and planting dates. And a lot of my information is coming from the Winter Harvest Handbook by Elliot Coleman. And Elliot Coleman is a grower from Maine and he really, um, has served as the winter growing guru for the Northeast. And so I highly recommend this book for people who are interested in getting into winter growing. And he really inspired um, a movement in his area for growing vegetables in the winter and really for four months out of the year. And then some of my information draws from experience from when I worked and studied at the University of New Hampshire, where we did some variety trials, looked at planting dates and heating regimens. And I can email this to everybody following our program, but there is an excellent blog from a former student at UNH named Claire Colley, and she um, gives some growing information, the results of the temperature research, and also uh, an enterprise budgeting tool in Excel, which it, it can be really useful. And then some of my information comes from Johnny's Selected Seeds as well. And so as I mentioned before, greens are really um, the most common grown in, in high tunnels in the winter and they are typically sown in the late summer or fall, harvested in the late fall um, up until usually maybe some holiday markets and then they typically will stop growing in the depths of the winter. So this time of year, for example, and then they'll resume growing once the days start getting longer. So here we're talking about spinach, mustards, kale, lettuce, bok choy, Swiss chard, and then there's some other specialty greens that some folks will have a market for, and these include crops such as Claytonia, Mosh, and Minutina. 
spinach is really, I would call it the superstar of winter production. It's really uh, dependable. And Johnny's breaks down different overwintered um, winter production crops into tiers. And they call tier one crops the most dependable. Spinach falls into this category. And it's highly dependable because it germinates really well in cool soil. And so this is a crop where you'll harvest it in the fall and then again in the late winter or spring once it resumes growth. And it can be grown for either baby or full size leaves. It can be used in salad mixes or sold on its own. And there are many different varieties available with different packages for disease resistance and other characteristics. And these are actually my personal favorites are the leafy brassica salad mixes, also known as Asian greens. And I really am drawn to them because they add a lot of color and texture to winter vegetable offerings. So you can just see in these photos here that there's just this tremendous uh, diversity of different shapes of leaves, colors, and textures, and they just grow really well in cold temperatures. And so these Asian greens are in the brassica family, the coal crops or the crucifers, and they're able to germinate and grow really quickly in cool soils, which is an excellent characteristic for crops that you're going to be seeding late in the season. And these again fall in that category of tier one dependable crops. <clears throat> so again, you sow those late in the summer or, or early fall, harvest in the fall, again in the late winter or spring. And for a baby leaves or a salad, it really only takes about, you know, three weeks for them to grow to size and then a little bit longer for a braising mix. And so depending on your customers, um, it might be easier to sell a baby mix for a salad, a braising mix. Um, I feel like sometimes takes a little bit more, um, a little bit more of an adventurous customer who might use these for cooking greens um, and again they come in many different colors textures and flavors and while some of these crops such as the mustards might be really spicy in the summer they can be really mellow and sweet in the winter one of my favorites out of these Asian greens is called Tokyo Bacana. And that's that really light colored green leaf that's in the middle of this photo. And it's really lettuce-like. And so it can be really popular with customers who are more used to buying um, you know, lettuce and, and lettuce mixes from the grocery store. But even though it tastes like and looks like lettuce, it grows much faster than lettuce, particularly in cool soil temperatures. And the regrowth from this crop is fairly reliable where you can cut it once or twice and the leaves will grow back and have a nice quality. And then Mizuna is another one of my favorites. And this is a more traditional Japanese green. It has more jagged leaves. So again, it adds some really nice texture to a salad mix, has a mild flavor. Um, but we found that sometimes regrowth can be fuzzy or off textured. So this one, I feel like can sometimes be a little bit less reliable in terms of repeated cutting. Atsoi, this one is fairly spinach-like. It has thick leaves, um, but it tends to germinate and grow a little bit quicker than spinach. And again, this can be sort of a spinach substitute in a salad mix. It has really crunchy stems and it grows in a rosette. It has a mild flavor and is more medium yielding compared to some of the other brassica greens. And then there are some other miscellaneous mustards and there are quite a few different varieties available. One of my favorites for adding to a salad mix is um, the purple frilly mustard. And these you really only need to sow um, a little bit compared to some of the green varieties um, to add some color to your mix. And they can be a little bit more pungent, especially in warm weather, but have a nice smell of flavor later in the fall. And then kale is another popular one. And so kale can be grown um, for a baby or a full size leaf. Again, of course, if you want more of a full-sized leaf, you'll have to start it quite a bit earlier um, in the summer or fall. And in terms of a cooking green, I feel like kale is a little bit more known by customers compared to some of the Asian greens at their full size. And then lettuce, while this is a customer favorite, it can be a little bit more tricky to grow. Johnny's considers it a tier two, less, slightly less dependable crop. But there are some great varieties that are available that are better suited for winter tunnel production. 
Again, lettuce is a little bit slower growing than the Asian greens. The Asian greens are in a different plant family, uh, the coal crop, so they're able to really quickly germinate and grow in colder temperatures especially for full-size heads of lettuce or even baby heads of lettuce, you'll need to plant them earlier than the brassicas and the mustards. And some of the Salanova or the one-cut varieties are really popular these days and can be sold um, for their leaves and salad mixes as well. And then there's some other baby leaf mixes that come in a variety of different colors. And then some of the other Greens that are popular but slightly, you know, less popular than the spinach and the lettuces and the Asian greens would be Swiss chard. It grows a little bit more slowly and can be a little bit more prone to winter kill. There's bok choy and then some of the other specialty greens. And in terms of overwintering root crops, these can be a bit more challenging. I think Johnny's put, puts these into the tier three. And there's some debate over whether carrots are worth the high tunnel space in the winter, especially for farms that really have their carrot storage down and working really well. Um, but some people will plant carrots and then um, overwinter them um, so that they can have fresh carrots at a different time of the year than what would traditionally be available in the fall. Some people will overwinter onions so that they can be the first to have onions at the market early in the in the summer or spring. Scallions are another possibility and also radishes and turnips and in particular um, you can see these white salad turnips on the right there, the, the Hakurai turnips. Those can be really mellow um, and just an excellent addition to salads for eating in the fall. Oh. That one's one of my favorites. I love those Hakurai turnips. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely delicious. Um, but one thing to consider, especially with radishes, so at a farm I used to work at, um, we were always a little bit disappointed. Later, later in the fall, the radishes can, can freeze and then you get kind of an off-colored center of the radish. So those are more susceptible to the freeze damage and those have mm -hmm. a, a shortened harvest window in the fall compared to the greens. And so for these crops, compared to the greens, you really, um, you know, especially for the carrots and the onions, you really, you don't have any fall harvest, you're just having a spring harvest. So they're taking up that space in the tunnel for quite a few um, months out of the winter. And here's some research that's from the University of New Hampshire, and they have a great fact sheet online for how to overwinter onions. So they did some trials looking at different varieties and planting dates. And so these onions were seeded in the late summer and harvested in the spring. And so again, the idea is to be the first person to the market with new onions. And growers in our area in New York are doing this as well. And I've seen some really nice size, great, sweet, perfect looking onions that were harvested, I think, probably around June. Does that sound right, mm -hmm. Judd? Yeah, if, if you have, if you do it, things just right. And it's, it's been pointed out that um, customers are ready for full sized onions um, really all year round. So there's uh, an opportunity there. Yeah, and so growers who have the onions early, they can get a price premium for, mm -hmm. for these onions. Um, and then I should also just point out that there is some, there are some varieties of onions that will bolt early. Um, so it does, you do need to pay attention to which particular varieties um, that you're going to over, overwinter compared to regular field production. And so all of these different crops are possible and one of the questions just thinking about how to grow them is should you transplant or should you direct seed? And it's not necessarily an easy question to answer because growers tend to do both and there are pros and cons for each one. And so for transplanting, one of the main benefits is that you can buy more time for your summer crop. So for people who have tomatoes that are still healthy and going strong, if they're still getting a good price for their tomatoes, um, it might be worth um, starting your spinach or other seedlings in a greenhouse first so that you can keep picking your tomatoes. And then, um, you know, three weeks later or so, once the spinach is ready to transplant, then you can um, take out those other crops and then prepare your tunnel. And it can also assure that you have a better stand of plants. 
And the downfall, of course, is that you um, need to have a place to start these transplants. And then for direct seeding, it can, it's less labor intensive. You don't have to deal with transplanting. Um, and then, you know, the downfall is that you would need to pull your summer crop sooner. And um, Judd and I visited a farm that was using a paper pot transplanter for transplanting their winter crops. And so there are some farms who have really found creative ways to lessen the, the labor requirement for transplanting. So different farms use diff a combination of both typically um, just to make, make things work for their particular operation. Mm -hmm. And so then, so how to plant, but also when to plant is a big question. And usually when we think about, um, you know, the onset of winter, we usually think about it being too cold for plants to grow. Well, that can be true. Actually, light is one of the major limiting factors to growing in the winter. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Persephone period. And my, I'm not very, I've never been very good at remembering history, but Persephone, I believe, was a Greek goddess, and um, she was banished to the underworld, and when she was gone, that's when winter was around, and when she came back, that's when spring started, and so um, Elliot Coleman and others call the Persephone period the time of year in the fall and winter when days are less than 10 hours long. And that depends on your latitude. And that's when plant growth pretty much stops. And so here's a picture of our high tunnel at the Cornell Research Farm. And this was November around two o'clock in the afternoon. So it kind of looks like the golden hour or that sunset is already starting at 2 p.m. So if sunlight is very limiting in these high tunnels in the winter. And so here is the Persephone period in Plattsburgh, New York. So this is where I live up in Clinton County, up near the Canadian border. And the days dip down to less than 10 hours a day of sunlight starting on November 5th. So if, if I were to want, you know, spinach and other crops to be harvested in November, say for the Thanksgiving market, I would need them to be just about ready to harvest by this by this time because the plants are not going to be growing very much until the day, the day length um, increases to more than 10 hours. And then here's later on in February, um, the days will start being more than 10 hours around February 5th. So the line there is a little bit off. And so then, um, in terms of the timing of the scheduling, so crops for deep winter markets must be grown by the onset of the Persephone period. So a lot of them are really just holding at this point. And so if you're going to be aiming for holiday markets in mid to late December, <coughs> um, you really want to have those plants pretty much at the point where they're ready to harvest by, by November. And typically in these systems, very little is harvested in January because a lot of it will have already been picked. The plants aren't really growing, so they're just staying dormant until the days get longer and the, the high tunnel gets a little bit warmer. And typically we, in our region, we start picking again in February once those days get longer. And then the, the use of row covers can really help speed the growth and protect the crops from freezing, as Judd was mentioning. And so in terms of scheduling, this is a chart from Johnny Seed. So you can see that if you want some full-size kale, for example, you might need to start them 13 to 15 weeks before that last 10-hour day, as opposed to tatsoi or spinach, only about um, five weeks before the days get shorter. And then for some of these other crops, um, you can see carrots and scallions, 13 weeks, um, all the way down to... Here's some mizuna or early maturing cress, only four weeks. Um, so the time of planting really depends on when your day lengths dip um, under that 10 hour period. And it also depends on the maturity that you're targeting for, for your crops. Are you aiming for baby or full size leaves? Um, are you looking at root crops? So getting to know the daylight schedule in your location is gonna be really important. And then also planning for your market. So if you're planning on having a lot of crop ready for say Thanksgiving or holiday markets, um, then that would factor into your scheduling as well. So 
So then uh, managing pests. So we're going to just transition to, away from talking about the crop possibilities and scheduling to pest and disease management. Often folks with new high tunnels will have a somewhat of a, a, a grace period where um, you don't have too many pest or disease problems, but usually after a couple of um, one or two years of production, some of these um, pests start moving in and prevention is really key. And so in your summer crops, um, trying to manage those pests before transitioning to the winter crops is critical. Tomatoes and cucumbers can harbor quite a few insect pests and um, some of these include aphids, um, some caterpillars, you know, white flies. And there is a correlation um, reported between high nitrogen fertility and large aphid populations. And Elliot Coleman, um, for example, he advocates um, a slim fertility regimen for winter crops so that he can keep the aphids at bay. And then um, if you are going to be applying a spray <clears throat> or biocontrols, it's best to do this early in the season. Um, some insecticides can be less effective in cold weather. And if you're spraying um, a liquid on leaves, you want to be doing this when it's warm on a sunny day, when the leaves can heat up. You don't want to be damaging the leaves by applying liquid that's going to freeze on the leaves. And so, for example, um, BT sprays for caterpillars, azadiractin, and other insecticides can be used indoors for high tunnel pest management. And for New York State in particular, um, any insecticides that are going to be used in a high tunnel should be labeled for indoor use on the label. And here, um, these photos show um, an aphid mummy. So here is a mummy that's been parasitized by a wasp. And so parasit um, parasitoid wasps can be released inside a tunnel in the summer if you have an aphid issue. These wasps will lay their eggs inside the aphid and then the wasp will, larva will develop in the aphid, eat its way from the inside out, and leave the circular exit hole in this um, dead shell of an aphid. And these can be um, highly effective in closed systems such as greenhouses or high tunnels. And so again, if you are going to be using biocontrol, it's best to start implementing this as early as possible so that you're not starting your winter season with a high aphid load or other um, pest pressure. And then voles and mammals can be really problematic in the winter, um, especially for high tunnels where you're using a lot of straw and cover. These animals really like to hide in that habitat. And a lot of folks will have been, have reported really serious losses to these animals, um, which is, <clears throat> um, you know, higher losses than, than what they would in the summer months. And so in terms of food safety, um, cats shouldn't be used for rodent control just because they can harbor um, some pathogens that can infect humans. And so uh, for food safety purposes, we recommend using a tin cat type traps. And then some people will use um, devices that make really high pitched noises. And I've heard really mixed reviews as to whether or not these work. So now we'll, I'll turn it over to Jed so that he can talk about disease control. Absolutely. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I think uh, Elizabeth makes a great point there when she says that growers report that damage from those pests is worse in the wintertime than it is in the summertime. And an important concept here is ties back to what Elizabeth shared about this period where there is really no, very little to no growth going on in the crop. So what that means is that it can't really sustain much damage at all because it can't grow through that damage. And what that, that could be um, rodents, that could be diseases, that could be insects. Everything we talk about when it comes to pest management in the wintertime comes with a heightened sense of the need for prevention, to preventatively uh, work against any of these uh, pests or diseases. So my task now is to highlight some of the key concepts around disease control in these high tunnels. And this first slide is a high tunnel, uh, a smaller high tunnel with winter greens. This picture was taken in mid-February and it's a sunny day. You can see there's some snow that's accumulated along 
the edge of the high tunnel. And it may be difficult to see, but the farmer is in the back of that image. Uh, he's bending over and looking at these, uh, these, this greens crop here, it's a lettuce crop. But he's obscured from my view entirely by a fog or mist. Um, and so what happens here is that overnight, the temperature of course drops and that drop occurs both inside and outside of the high tunnel. The sun comes out in the daytime and the high tunnel warms up considerably and you get a lot of uh, steam or mist, which then will condensate on the plastic and rain down back on top of the crop. And if you remember earlier on, I mentioned that one of the major advantages of, of a high tunnel is keeping the canopy dry to prevent diseases that oftentimes need freestanding moisture. Uh, so ventilation is absolutely essential for managing diseases in greenhouses. It's the most important thing we can do to prevent diseases in greenhouses or high tunnels. Ventilation is also important for some other uh, principles of plant growth. Um, in particular, we reduce our relative humidity. It allows the plants to transpire or pull up water from the root zone uh, and then move that out through uh, openings in their leaves and if the relative humidity is too high in the air they can't do that and then photosynthesis uh, will come to a halt as well. Next slide please. Can we advance Elizabeth? I'm trying but my <laughs> okay. presentation seems to be, there we go. Okay, so now I want you to contrast that last image where it was so foggy that you couldn't even see the farmer compared to how clear this image is. Uh, so you can see two people here harvesting along uh, a rows of spinach. And there's a few things I wanna point out here. One is that it's a sunny day, so the row cover is drawn back to the edge of the high tunnel, and that will allow moisture to escape from the crop canopy. And that's gonna help us with disease considerably is by reducing that moisture. You'll also notice in the gable end or the far end of this high tunnel, there's a very large vent. Um, that's about, I think, three feet by four feet. And you will be surprised to know that that vent stays open almost all winter. It stays open in sub-freezing temperatures. It stays open down to zero degrees. The grower told me one time he only closes that at 10 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Um, the concept here is by having this open, we are constantly removing moisture out through those vents. Cold air will always have less relative humidity than warm air. So even though we would like to hold on to that warm air, if the sunlight is not sufficient to promote plant growth, then we really don't need that temperature or want that temperature because all it's doing is driving disease and uh, decay or breakdown in that crop, which doesn't have enough sunlight to do its work. So the important concept to take away from this image is ventilation, passive ventilation should be occurring uh, nearly all the time in high tunnel greenhouses. Uh, I'll also point out that the height of the crop canopy here is very small. It's only a few inches relative to the overall height of the greenhouse or high tunnel, which may be 16 feet in height. What this does is create a large volume of air, which has a more uh, steady temperature and relative humidity than a smaller greenhouse. So having a tall greenhouse with adequate venting is uh, very important to disease prevention. Next slide, please. So now plant density is another thing that we can consider to reduce the relative humidity within the crop canopy. Um, if you look at the Swiss chard, which is easy to pick out here, that is planted on a six inch grid, meaning that there is six inches either direction to the next nearest plant. Some people do this on an eight inch grid. Some people go much tighter than that. But the point here is that these plants 
will have much less disease than if they're packed together. If they're packed together, we begin to have senescence of the older leaves. They just turn yellow, they turn brown because they don't have uh, adequate access to sunlight. And then once those leaves break down, they become susceptible to a fungus that we call gray mold or botrytis. And then that botrytis or gray mold can begin to infect other plants as well. So by spacing out our plants, we reduce relative humidity, which reduces disease, and we reduce leaf senescence. Another important point with having a crop that's spaced out, if I do need to apply a fungicide or perhaps an insecticide, I'm gonna have better efficacy because I can get better penetration into that crop canopy. Next slide, please. Yeah, so juxtapose that previous slide to this one and how dense that crop is planted. Um, I would also like to point out the crops that are being grown here. And the message I'd like you to take away from this has to do with crop rotation, which sometimes is difficult in high tunnel growing. But you'll notice on the far left, if you can see it, that we have a spinach crop. And then in the middle, we unfortunately have a very weedy row middle, that's chickweed. And then we have a large bed of beet greens. Well, I imagine a lot of you know that beets and spinach are in the same family. And they share, that means they share the same diseases. In particular, they're both susceptible to a disease called Cercospor leaf spot, which creates a uh, brown circular lesion on the leaf. And that's what we have here. So beets and spinach um, are in the same family, so is Swiss chard, and they're all gonna share diseases. Since we have so little space, and we have a limited number of crops that we can grow, number one, we wanna prevent the disease from ever happening, but we also wanna think about rotating as much as we can, so that we're not growing the same family of crop year after year in the same space. Next slide, please. This is a disease um, called downy mildew on one of those Asian greens that Elizabeth told us about. And one of the most important things you can do as you move into winter growing is to look at your seed catalog and see what are the disease resistant packages that come with any crop. So for downy mildew, it may something say something like DM resistant, or in the case of powdery mildew resistant, PM resistant. And I would look at a seed catalog from a company that does a lot of business with winter growing. And this isn't meant as an endorsement to anyone in particular, but uh, Elizabeth pointed out Johnny's has a lot of information on winter growing. That's because they have a large customer base of winter growers. So they're getting a lot of feedback on which varieties have resistance and which ones don't to these diseases. You can look at their catalog or many other ones that serve growers in the Northeast that are going to list those plant disease ratings on the varieties. Next slide, please. All right, thanks, Judd. Yep. So I'm just going to end our program with a research update from the Cornell Willsboro Farm. So for the past few years, Judd and my predecessor, Amy Ivey, um, and myself, we've been working on some spinach research, trying to look at the effect of planting date and nitrogen fertilizer on spinach yield. And so I just have a few of our results from last year's study here that I'd like to share with you this evening. And so for this experiment, we transplanted spinach at two different dates. Um, the first was seeded on August 27th, and then the second there on the right was seeded on September 10th, transplanted probably about three weeks later. <clears throat> and um, what we found was that it doesn't seem like a big um, difference in planting date, but we had significantly higher yields from the earlier planting compared to the late planting. And I've also heard from some other growers that even just a few days difference in seeding or transplanting can make a big difference in getting your crop at the right stage at the right time in the fall when plants are just growing really slowly. So this experiment just reinforced um, the, the importance of early planting date for winter greens. And we harvested this crop at three different dates. So in October, November, and then the crop rested for December and January when um, the temperature was really cold, when the days were really short. It was really just hanging out, not under any row cover in this particular um, location, but 
was in, in a single layer plastic high tunnel in Willsboro. And then once the days started getting longer, we did our next harvest in February, and then a final harvest in April. And then we took up the plants just um, because typically a grower would be prepping the high tunnel for tomatoes at that point. And so in addition to our planting date, we had three different nitrogen fertilizer treatments. We had no fertilizer, we had um, 65 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 130, and then 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And um, the, the inspiration from this project in part was because we had heard lots of different reports from growers of um, of using different nitrogen fertility rates that were just wildly different, anywhere from you know, 65 or 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre to I think upwards of 400 or 500 um, pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is a lot of um, for fertilizer for a, a leafy greens crop. But believe it or not, Elizabeth, we had someone tell us 600 pounds 600, of nitrogen wow. per acre. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it does seem crazy. That's much more than even what corn would require in a growing season. And so we were just curious, you know, what is the actual optimum nitrogen for fertilizer, you know, rate for this crop in a high tunnel. So in general, you know, growing recommendations for crops in the field are fairly well established. Um, we have a general idea for how much fertilizer different crops require, but in a, in a winter growing condition in a high tunnel, the soils are cold. Um, we're not usually watering the crop very much in the winter, and we don't fully understand yet how the crops are responding to different um, soil fertility regimes. And so the, the surprising result from this experiment was that we actually didn't find any significant difference in yield between spinach fertilized with no fertilizer to the crop fertilized with 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And so that's just leading us to question whether these really high rates of nitrogen are necessary. Um, so we are going, we are actually repeating the experiment this year. So we have spinach growing at the Willsboro Research Farm again. We're testing these different nitrogen rates and using two different types of fertilizer. We're using Pro Booster and a feather meal. So it'll be really interesting to see if we can, um, if we have these same findings this year. And um, I, you know, we continue to hear of growers using very different rates of fertilizer and it sometimes makes us wonder, I think, if some of, if those high fertilizer rates are maybe helping tomatoes that are coming after the crop rather than the spinach itself. Jed, do you have anything to add on this study before we move on? Um, I don't think so. I think it's, um, it's, it's very interesting. We're not claiming that it is the, um, uh, authoritative uh, uh, information on how to fertilize in um, in high tunnels, but we do feel like we're seeing some, we're uncovering some very interesting data on terms of the benefit of adding all of that nitrogen or lack of benefit. And so this is information we see that could save uh, high tunnel growers considerable amount of costs and we should thank uh, the Northern New York Agricultural Development Program for funding this work over the last several years. Yeah, and I think it also just um, shows us that, you know, more, more research is needed for high tunnel production and especially with their increase in popularity. Well, they're not a new technology, but I feel like we still don't know exactly um, what's going on in the soil and we're still fine-tuning our recommendations for growing. Absolutely, we're learning right alongside growers as we go. Okay, so it's my turn to touch upon some basics here of marketing when it comes to winter greens. And it may seem simple, we're growing something that is unavailable altogether locally at this time of year and marketing it, marketing the crop should be uh, a piece of cake. If that were the case, that would be great, but in truth, it's not. Generally, we need to cultivate markets for winter-grown crops 
because our customer base isn't used to receiving local product that time of year. And that applies to both retail and wholesale sales. So the image I share with you here is from our friends, Paul and Sandy Arnold, who operate with their family, Pleasant Valley Farm in Argyle, New York, that's uh, in Washington County. And this is a slide that they share talking about the profitability of high tunnels for them. And what you'll notice is that their average tunnel sales, this is off of um, two um, one-tenth of an acre, so about 4,500 square feet uh, high tunnels or greenhouses. And they were able to sell around $1,700, mainly in greens, from those two high tunnels. Now notice, from November 2nd to June 1st. And so their profitability around winter-grown greens takes them all from the fall, mid-fall, all the way up to almost um, summertime because they're going all the way up to June 1st to achieve those high values of sales. Where do they do that? They do it at a couple of farmer's markets that include winter sales. So it includes some fall and some spring winter's markets, but most important for them is the availability of a win enclosed winter farmer's market and a customer base that's used to, has become accustomed to getting fresh greens all winter long. What is the price per pound? I don't know what their price per pound is, but other growers are marketing this crop at somewhere around $16 per pound. That means that a small bag may cost the consumer anywhere from four to six to eight dollars uh, for a bag of greens. So if you're going into this, do you have the customer base to support those types of sales. For the system to be profitable, there needs to be a premium for that product. So do you have customers that are willing to pay a premium for winter grown greens? If you do, it's a great idea. Those are my quick thoughts on marketing. Should we yeah, move I guess on to maybe a Q and A? Sure, thanks Jed. Yep, unless you, did you have a thought there you wanted yeah, to share? Yeah, I was just, I was thinking of a farm that we visited earlier this fall where um, I guess they, their thought was that by giving their customers something green in every box or almost every box of their winter CSA, CSA share, they were able to draw in more CSA members um, and kind of boost the appeal of their root, of their root crops. Absolutely. So I think the greens are, help make a CSA that's going into the wintertime uh, more competitive, more attractive to customers. I would say it's almost an essential if you're running a wintertime CSA to include some greens there at this point. Um, and those, those greens do drive the sales of other field grown products such as sweet potatoes or um, Irish potatoes or onions. Yeah. All right, um, so it's, we have about seven minutes for questions, and if you'd like, you can unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask, or um, another option is to type it into the chat box. Right. So we have a question, are horizontal fans useful in winter? Uh, from Harrison Bardwell. Um, I'll share some thoughts on that and I'd welcome yours too, Elizabeth. Um, the quick answer would be yes, Harrison, different people use them for different purposes. Just so people are clear what we're talking about, horizontal uh, air fan or HAF as they're called in the industry is not an exhaust fan. It's really a circulation fan that's moving air within the greenhouse. Uh, and so sometimes these are positioned in the wintertime with an angle that is pushing air down into the crop so that we're losing less air out through the plastic. So people actually use it to drive air down into the canopy, both for um, heat retention 
And then the more traditional use, which is to break up what we call boundary layer of humidity, relative humidity around the crop canopy, which reduces disease. All right, looks like we have another question from Hannah. Can you talk about how hoops, different styles and strategy, and weight of row cover? Sorry, can you talk about row hoops and weight of row cover? Sure. You want me to take a stab at it, Elizabeth? Or? Sure, yeah, and then I'll chime yeah. in. So the, the primary two strategies we have around hoops, these are just kind of a light gauge metal hoop that easily sticks into the soil on either side and just provides a, a, a little bit of support for that row cover over top of it. There's two strategies really, either to use them or not use them. And increasingly, I think we're seeing people not use them on most crops. Uh, and Paul and Sandy Iredell, who I mentioned before, have done a lot of temperature studies and they find that they're retaining more heat by having those row covers flat over the crop. Now, sometimes that's simply not practical. If you think about say like a very tall Swiss chard or something like that, that could easily snap uh, with the weight of a row cover. And in that case, they do prefer uh, using the hoops to keep it up off of the crop canopy. But now there does seem to be a growing consensus that we're probably trapping more heat by having the row cover as close to the ground as possible uh, and hopefully not damaging the canopy. Now to not damage that canopy, it requires multiple weight, multiple layers of row cover. That's important. A single layer is not a great idea uh, because if frost forms inside, uh, of the high tunnel and it forms on that single layer of row cover that frost can burn the, the foliage. And so either two or three layers uh, and generally people are using a mid-weight um, row cover and they rate the rating by weight is done by ounces per square yard, which is kind of funny, but it's 0 .0 0.9 uh, ounces is the weight that I would say most people use, which is considered a mid-weight. Yeah, I think in my experience um, at the farm I worked at, we used uh, wire hoops with two layers of mid-weight. Um, and I know that some, some folks at the conference we were just at were really lamenting using the thinner row cover just because it tears really easily. If you step on it, it might rip. Um, mm -hmm. So really something at least mid-weight in terms of being able to use it for at least one year and getting that protection is, is recommended. All right, I think we have time for another question or two, if anybody has any final thoughts. All right, so can the horizontal fans run 24 seven? Well, they can and do in a lot of, a lot of greenhouses that are growing other crops uh, to refer back to tomatoes in particular. Um, I work with many greenhouses that have those HF fans are going 24 seven. I don't see that as often in high tunnels um, for winter growing. Many of the winter growing operations that Elizabeth and I work with don't even have electric out to the, um, out to the tunnel. And so in that case, they can't run those things. They don't have them. Um, I would want to, begin to look at the value of running them 24 seven um, and the energy cost, um, particularly in those um, shoulder months that really the climate is just fine for these cold hardy crops that we're talking about. Uh, and I'd probably use those horizontal airflow fans really only in the coldest months if I had to. All right. Any last questions? All right, so harvesting when the leaves are frozen. Yeah, so. That, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say it. So ideally, um, you know, you wouldn't be harvesting frozen leaves. And then some folks will, I believe the Arnolds will turn on their heat a little bit sometimes just to thaw the leaves so that they can harvest. Um, so usually, yeah, 
usually folks will not harvest when the leaves are, are frozen. Yeah, that's probably an important point is that the harvesting takes place above freezing generally. And so if you don't have supplemental heat, you are at the mercy of having uh, either a day that is above freezing outside or enough sunlight to get your interior um, canopy temperature above freezing. So those leaves are turgid again when we harvest them. Opening sidewalls to harden crops on sunny days to get a stronger crop. Um, first, I've, first I've heard of that. Um, yeah, I haven't heard of that as well. I mean. So many of the, of the tunnels we work with um, can't raise their size. If they have curtains that roll up, a lot of times there's enough snow there that they're not able to operate those in the winter time. Yeah, I mean, people will roll up the sides, you know, earlier in the, in the fall just to get some air circulation on a warm day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Saw it about lettuce in New Jersey. Yeah, no, it's, it's new to me. I'm not, not real familiar with that. I do have people, more warm season growers that will open up those sides in the winter time. Uh, and, and that they think that by allowing the, the tunnel to freeze out, they'll have better pest control. And then let's see, I think our last question will be, is it possible to plant in raised beds in the high tunnel to improve soil quality in Adirondack soil? Um, I guess my answer to this would be yes, that um, I do work with some growers who will um, build some short raised beds so that they can have more, more control over the, the media or the soil in which their crops are growing. Absolutely. Yep. You can definitely improve soil uh, with appropriate levels of amendments. All right, well, I think this wraps up our workshop. So thank you all for attending. And um, it is my intention to post this online once we're done. So in case you'd like to refer to it or share it with anyone in the future. And I did have a couple of resources, I think that I mentioned that I can email to everybody on the list. And if you do have any lingering questions, please feel, feel free to email us. Our email, email addresses are listed below. And we're happy to correspond with you in the future if you have any questions about winter growing.